Are you ready for the medicine of the future? I'm ready. Bring it on. I think I'm ready. I don't really know what it's all about. That's why Dr. Dumar is here, and I'm the curious patient asking the questions here on the Be Well Now podcast. That sounds exciting, medicine of the future. I like that. Who came up with that one again? This guy. I'm going to say that was you. I'm all about the future, the now. Actually, no, I'm about the now, because this is the Be Well Now podcast. We want to focus on living in the present and being well. And your business is community health and wellness. Calling it a business is not the way that I think I view it or, or practice. You view it. It's yeah. a practice. Yeah. So we're in business, I guess. I say it like a it's so cold to call it a business. Sure. Sure. But if you love what you do, I mean you are running a bit we already just You're always you're you're running a business. I'm going off track. That's part of it. But the fact of the matter is you uh you know, I think this is good because it's an interesting uh it's an interesting analogy to what we're going to talk about today because I run a practice uh and I run a business. Sure. And I work, I'm, a, I'm an employee, uh, but I'm an owner. So there's a lot of different hats that I, that I have. And so we could study and you could say, okay, I am just one of those things. Or you could describe me and say, okay, I'm going to best understand this individual by taking one piece of what it is I do. And you mentioned earlier that as I asked you, what the heck is the medicine of the future, just to prep for this podcast, you could you could look at a small thing or the system, yeah, in a body, for instance, and and how to treat cholesterol maybe or mm-hmm. any sort of condition, and and I feel like the way that I've worked with you in the past because I'm your patient and I believe in what you do and that's why we're here because I always ask you about this stuff. Is you're not just going after the one symptom? You're like, what else is going on here? You you run the blood tests. And you look over them with a fine tooth comb and come up with sort of a narrative, as far as I can tell. You listen to your patients, and then you show them the data, and you, you come up with a storyline. And that's so much more involved than I think, you know, Western medicine typically handles things. But you, you talked about the medicine of the future. So maybe I'll stop talking, and, and you can share your thoughts. Well, I like how what you're describing as far as a narrative, right? And that, that's what it is. We come up with this, this storyline or this narrative of what's going on in the body. Uh, We don't look at it necessarily as, oh, this is high, therefore, or this is low, therefore. Um, A number of things that happen to coalesce or or group together start to tell a story. Uh, Patterns start to describe uh, a physiological mechanism occurring. And so I don't look at just, is this high or is this low? We look at it from a system standpoint and say, what's the story of your physiology and what direction are you headed and how, if if necessary, um, do we alter that course? Now, that seems like a reasonable way to view health, but that's not the way that healthcare exists in today's society. I imagine doctors want to help and they'll ask questions about their patients' lives and be there as not only a medical practitioner, but then probably a therapist as well. Like you probably wear so many hats, you know, but, and yet I feel like we all know at some level, the system is broken. Yeah. The, so the system, well, the system is doing what the system was designed to do. And that's a reductionistic system. What does that mean? Reductionistic. So it, it essentially means you break things down into their little parts. So you, instead of you have a, let's say you have a complex problem in order to solve that problem, you're going to say, okay, if I can find the most minute, um, the minute piece of this that happens to be the variation from the norm, then I can, by correcting that minute piece, bring that system back to balance. Give me an example of that. So uh, let's say you come in, you present, and you uh, you are sick to the doctor. And she's like, okay, well, let's let's see. I don't know exactly what's wrong with you. Obviously, I can tell you're sick. You have a fever, you have a temperature, whatever, and then uh, we're going to we're going to test your blood, or we're going to check for a specific type of pathogen. And this is one of the reductionistic views: is that we look at things um, from that pathogen type of view. Is like, okay, what's the specific pathogen that's affecting your body right now? That if I eliminate, I think you'll be well. So I need to divide and conquer 
that's really the reductionistic view. If we can divide these, if we can divide this great big system into lots of little different parts and then conquer it, so to speak, or take it over, if it's a, a pathogen in that case, then we're going to create what we call health. So is that like if I have a headache, taking an Advil will make it go away, but there's something deeper down that's causing the headache that we're not addressing? Right. There's some sort of physiological mechanism. It's A headache is a signal to you. Pain in your body is a signal to you that there's some f- physiological dysfunction. Right? When I, if I fall, my body says, ow, to me. I'm like, oh, gosh, that hurts. Well, why is it hurting? It's hurting to tell me that I need to address something in that area. It's not hurting to tell me to take more Advil. In the moment, though, that is kind of nice when, it, when the pain goes away. It is nice. Oh, I'm not, so there's so I'm much, not arguing that. And you were saying earlier that, that this reductionistic view has led to most advancements in our scientific it, It's history. led to an amazing amount of advancements, and we have learned a significant amount, right? And I, I look at it at some point where we are. At some point, what we start to see happening is we look beyond, I would say, look beyond the mark. So... The, the point being, the mark, I'm a marksman, I want to hit the target. What's the target in medicine? Well, the target in medicine is the patient. So the patient is a system. The patient is actually not a, a, a it, it's not something that you divide and conquer. The patient isn't, right? But we have learned a lot through those mechanisms. And, and I mean, since since the 1600s, since the Renaissance, since Descartes, right? We've been practicing this uh, reductionistic view where we will break things down into their systematic parts and then try to, try to solve the complex problem. So here's, a, here's um, wh- one of the earliest areas we started to recognize that we were in an antiquated approach or using an antiquated system to approach medicine is actually uh, the double helix DNA, right? So when we started to study and go through this DNA project, we realized that the, there was, <clears throat> we have, we have um, within our DNA and our makeup, we have different chromosomes and we have all of the, this makeup. So we have probably about 30,000 markers that are, that contribute to our um, genetic makeup, right? And a nematode or a worm has um, not a whole lot less than that. So then the question we're asking is, well, what is differentiating us from this? And you can actually go back in historical records and we can see that there are genetic lines that tie us back to uh, uh, ancestrally to worms. Uh, and I know this is maybe feeling like it's getting way off, but the point is we're, we have to be asking, well, at what point did we start differentiating from this? And how does our, even though it seems like our DNA is somewhat lined up to some degree, what's differentiating us? Well, what's allowing us to be different? Well, what we're realizing now in the study of DNA is that there's so much more. Like we used to think with DNA, we could find a very specific um, pattern or snip or problem within your DNA, and then we could plug and play. We could fix that, and things are gone, right? Or we could find the cancer gene, or we could find the autoimmune gene, or we could find whatever gene was the problem, and we could fix that gene, and you're done. And the reality is... That's not how it is. Okay, that makes sense to me. I was wondering where you were going, but okay, that makes sense to me. Yes. So the idea that the DNA would be this whole story is... Well, we've been, we, we approached discovery of the DNA from this reductionistic view. That's what helped us discover DNA was the reductionistic view. But then the application of the DNA, we realized, cannot be understood through a reductionistic view because there are so many different interactions that take place or potentials that take place or can take place with the DNA um, at any given moment. 
based on chemicals, based on um, environmental exposures, based on sunlight, the lack of sunlight, based on um, you know water, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, all of these things actually influence the expression of the DNA. I don't want to get us off topic, but if you have some um, patient come in with a certain issue, you're going to try to figure out what's causing that issue, what's happening within the system of this body. Can we address that? And obviously you want to get to the symptom, but you want to understand what could be causing it. You don't want to just change one, I don't know, blood marker or something like that would come up in a test differently and call it good. And that's the approach that I know you take. And so sort of reductionist versus system based. Yeah, so Is that the, what you're talking about for the future of medicine? Right. Uh, yeah, so we're we're becoming more systematic. We're we're and I would say what we're looking for and what I see happening uh, ideally for the patient what would be what we would want to happen is the incorporation of systems biology throughout medicine. And and systems systems biology can actually incorporate and be benefited with a reductionistic view in some ways. So it, they can still function, they can function together is the point. But we've been, we've been overly focused on the reductionistic view. Here's, here's an example. In, I think it was the 1960s, uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, diastolic measure, so we have systolic and diastolic, um, sorry. What does that even mean? What's that? Systolic. Systolic and diastolic. We have systolic and diastolic measures as far as with our blood pressure. We have the, the top number and the lower number, and it has to do with how well you're uh, essentially um, contracting and releasing the blood and how much pressure it's requiring to eject um, blood from your heart into the rest of your body. So we're getting a measure of that. Well, our, our lower number uh, used to be uh, at... 105 was the an acceptable uh, level. Then in about the it was around the 80s, we lowered that number to um, 90. And now we've also recently lowered that value to 80 being the most uh, acceptable and anything between 80 and 90 being considered uh, essentially, pre-hypertension, okay? So what we've done now, though, is we've said, okay, there, there's going to be variables throughout the population, people who tend to have or develop blood pressure, higher blood pressure, and they're going to tend to have higher values or numbers. Now, by taking an overall approach, a reductionistic view, and a system, uh, lacking the systematic view, but we're taking a... Um, employing essentially uh, um, a policy approach, right? Saying because of this reductionistic study that we did, we know that patients actually need to be lower on this because they tend to have less you know, heart disease or whatever, cardiovascular disorders. And so by pulling that number f- down for everyone, it doesn't enable us or allow us to to um, to factor in the variable individuals, which is probably about thirty percent of the of the people of the population that would be in in that category. We're not factoring them in, and so now we are potentially what we're doing is we're recommending these people for treatments and or surgeries when they really don't need it. And they would likely be physiologically just fine and, and do well throughout their lives without any treatment and without any surgery at all. But now because we've simply lowered this line and this bar, it lines them all up for a recommendation for drugs and surgery. So that's a problem, right? And we can see through reduc- this reductionistic means that it doesn't serve the variable, it doesn't serve, uh, well, what happens along the way, right? What happens with the person who happens to be this more of an exception? Well, we have to be able to have a place to address those exceptions and the variables because there's a significant amount of people 
that fall into those categories. All right, so hypertension, essentially, it's like it takes a number. What we do is we, we knock this number down. So the number was higher. It used to be higher in the 1960s, okay? It was acceptable. It was considered acceptable. And then we had, you know, a certain value or number of cardiovascular-related events. Now, what we've done is we've taken that to 90, then we've taken it down to acceptable at 80. So we've reduced the or lowered the threshold. So what that means is we're going to have a lot more people following into the threshold or into the disease state simply because we lowered the threshold. So their numbers are going to show that they are diseased now. Right. But before they didn't? Correct. Was, was that better or is it better now? Well, I guess that's for us to see. But the, the variable nature of this is what I'm saying. Whether we have it at 105 or at 90 or at 80, well, does that, does that really matter? It's not incorporating. It's not a systems approach. It doesn't incorporate the variable. And so, therefore, it recommends to everybody, all of those people who fall into that pattern, regardless, it recommends to all of them that they need a specific treatment, a therapy, a drug, or a medic, or, or a surgery. But there's going to be a lot more involved behind the scenes than just those numbers. Yes. So, uh, again, we can look at it another way. Um, when, when we look at a fish pond, right, we can... Let's not say a fish bowl. Let's start with just a, a goldfish jar, a bowl, fish bowl. So we're trying to maintain the health of this water for the fish. And uh, typically to maintain the, the health of the fish, we want to maintain the health of the water, of the environment, right? And the reason we want to maintain the health of the environment is because we know that directly impacts the fish. But if we say you know what, we only want to study the fish in a reductionistic way. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, basically remove from our consideration the quality of the water, right? Then all, all we're studying now is what's happening to that fish. And let's say that this fish happens to reside in water that is chemically toxically laden right and then we see that it's it's uh, hypertension its levels go up well great now now all we have to do is implement a drug right or this reductionistic view tells us we can just simply do this and it will help bring those that blood uh, pressure down well the other way to look is at, at that is to say what are the other variables that could be affecting the fish well, it's air, it's water, it's environment, it's interactions with, with others, right? Um, if you put a beta fish in there or, you know, you put some other fish in there that might peck at it and, and cause problems. So the variable is, is something that needs to be considered that reductionistic uh, medicine has a really difficult time uh, addressing. Well, yeah, I mean, your well-meaning doctor could ask you a few questions about your life and you have maybe a nice little visit, five, ten minutes long, and then you're taking this medication every single day, affecting every minute of your life. The idea is you want to feel better, yeah. but you're not getting a ton of engagement in terms of your, your big story, and I just feel like this is the way to do it, to really get engaged, to try to figure out what is going on in the water, that goldfish tank, to deal with the ecosystem, is this realistic, though? You talk about the future of medicine being more of this approach. How do you make this a more realistic thing for everybody? Because I just don't see most people being this engaged in their health, and I don't know that doctors get your mindset either. Right. I don't know. I'm not well, an there are there are a lot of really great doctors out there that are pushing in this direction, uh, systems biology, uh, systems medicine, um, and and a, an incorporated view of reductionistic and systems medicine is really what we're looking at to consider. But a classic example of systems medicine is Chinese medicine. Uh, it's been around for thousands of years. It's been practiced for thousands of years, and it incorporates literally a system as it describes the body uh, as a representation of nature. Um, it has certain organs. Uh, there's an organ that represents wood, which is a, a, a metal or a mineral in nature, right? Not a metal. It's a, it's a substance in nature. Thank you. And then uh, also 
your heart, you have an organ within the body that would represent fire or heat, an organ in the body that would represent uh, earth, dirt, uh, materials, metals, water. So all of those elements of the earth are coming together and exist actually because of their interdependence. They don't exist because they're completely dependent of one another. They exist because they're completely interdependent, meaning they exist uh, together, right? So you have the creation of gold. You have the creation of tungsten. You have the creation of all of these different metals and minerals in the earth because of where they fall, elements, minerals, and where they line up. And the statistical um, variation of which other minerals and metals happen to fall next to them, right? And if they happen to line up in a variety of um, appropriate or advantageous ways, then all of a sudden, boom, we get gold. So it's that magic of, of the atmosphere that is creating the gold, not as opposed to the gold needs to be silver. Let's make the gold silver versus how do we turning lead to gold right yeah i don't know. I, th- I think i think i get what you're saying though for sure and you know my mind goes to chinese medicine and and a previous iteration of me would have been like well that was in the past how quaint yes people died at a young age over the course of millennia what does chinese medicine really know i mean yeah. that's got to be way outdated um and you know just dismissive words like Fufu, hippie, whatever like terms that would be like I'm all in. I believe in it all here. But but the the critical part of my mind is like people are gonna shut off when you say stuff like that. Like how do you Well it's a good time get people to people wanna feel well, you know? Yeah, and it's a that's good time. That's your goal and that's uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut No, you I'm off. just I get a passion about it because I'm like I'm just thinking of like someone like my dad, who would never even consider like a Chinese herb that you might prescribe. Yeah. And you just want to help people. You're not here to like let me bring some Eastern medicine, weird right. philosophy that you don't believe in. Like, Let's throw some voodoo on you, baby. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, like how do you get people to buy into that? And how do, you, how do you sell them on the fact that Chinese medicine isn't antiquated? So all those random thoughts were in my mind about, they just like literally shot up like a wall yeah. when you mentioned that. I think, yeah, and I think that's great. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and I think it's a good time to acknowledge as well just where this approach to medicine has brought us. And I, and I think people ought to acknowledge and recognize that we have reached the first time in our um, existence, perhaps, or our, uh, as a country, let's put it that way, uh, in, the, in the future, what's going to happen right now? Let me say it this way. We have just reached a point where our kids, their lifespan is actually shorter than us. Okay? So the question to that, we need to go, well, why is it that our kids at this point, at least the the projections that are being made, is that those coming into the world now are actually going to be living shorter life span than those who came in prior? Well, that's that doesn't seem that seems completely backward to everything uh, progress uh, stands for. So what we really should be asking is, if that is the case, should we be reconsidering our approach to health and wellness? And maybe at least reconsidering what that even means. What does it mean to be healthy? Does, if I go to my doctor and he says, hey, look, you fall within all the parameters, good for you. Is that healthy? And the reality, it's not on a lot of occasions. It's not. Well, you fall into the averages of the U.S. population, which happens to be ranked 39th out of 40 for the developing nations on Earth as far as the health of their citizens. Congratulations. We could do a golf clap or a slow clap. But what has that got you? What has it got you? And yes, we have the most advanced uh, for what I can For what I can surmise, we seem to be at a time that has the highest amount of technology. We seem to be highly intelligent, incredibly skilled. We've accomplished huge feats. 
right? So what's going on with our health? Right. I was just thinking of all those things you talked about with the advancement of society and technology. And so many people are unwell. Like what, yeah. what's happening? We're going backward as that, far as our health goes. That's so unreasonably bad in my estimation because we're better than that. Yeah, we are, we are better than that. And what it requires is us recognizing that, again, I am not, I am more than just this physical form, which requires some acknowledgement or some level of acknowledging system, a system running this form, which means I could step up and say, well, my neurology or no, my neurology has an impact. It's initiating contractions down the Purkinje fibers of my heart and eliciting the blood to be pumped through with the rest of my body and the cells of the blood are carrying nutrients. Okay, that's what's going on. But even there within the blood, you have a statistical chance of, okay, what, what nutrients are actually being exchanged in that cell? How much potassium, how much sodium, how much chloride? And when we do a blood draw, it's at that moment we're getting a snapshot in time. So one of the considerations we, can, we talk about in systems biology is context of space and time. Where is this individual and at what time, right? And if you're, if you're in New York City at 3 a.m. versus in New York City at, at um, let's say, 9 a.m., is it going to be different? Is the context different? Are are the people different that you meet? Are you know are there different things that you have to consider? And if something as simple as uh, a city with streets and buildings can can give you changes of context in space and time that are going to alter what you as an individual decide to do, whether it's your path home or it's who you decide to talk to or how long or what restaurant you choose to eat at or a bar, or if you choose to sit down, uh, you know, on the sidewalk uh, at, at a nice eatery or somewhere else, right? What you decide to do is going to be based on space and time. Our cells are no different. They're no different. What's available in my surrounding? What do I have here? What's the environment like? Those are the decisions that are being, are being made in systems biology that we have to incorporate if we want to really start to begin to grasp and understand a person's health. And we do have statistical and computational modes and methods to be able to get to this point. It's not a perfect place. It's not a perfect um, approach yet by any means. But it certainly is better than the one we're pursuing right now that has created a shorter life expectancy for our kids than we ourselves enjoy. So the future of medicine, is this a hope? Is this inevitable? What, what do you mean when you say the future of medicine? That's a good question as well. I, what I mean by the future of medicine is that medicine goes this way or we all die. <laughs> right? It's... This is going to be, this is the, the inevitable, it's an inevitability in my opinion. We're going to get there. One of the reasons why I think is because the public is pushing us there. People are pushing the, the doctors there. People are pushing the uh, reductionistic system to change in some way. We have seen uh, attempts at prevention this idea of prevention. But, but usually within the reductionistic view, again, prevention comes down to, you know what, we've discovered this gene that, that we can do this test for, and you can get this test to see if you have the gene. Then you know you have the gene, so if you know you have the gene, you want to be careful in XYZ, right? And that's usually the approach to um, that's the approach to prevention in the reductionistic model, right? So those tests, I'm not saying, are bad. 
But again, it's a snapshot in time, and our DNA has the capacity to change. It, based on alterations or based on environmental cues, we can adapt and change. We've, we've adapted over millennia. And so, of course, this is, a, this is an ever-perpetuated changing system that if we want to understand, we have to be able to kind of dive in there and say, what's happening? What are you exposed to? Some of the things that medicine is trying to figure out how to incorporate into its system and studies is how does our sleep affect our health? How do circadian rhythms affect our health? Right? These these type of things that we don't really how how does, you know, meditation, how does the state of one's mind generally affect their health? Um you, you write a paper and you can read these studies and they generally come out, well, people who have more optimistic views seem to be happy, happier. Um, okay, right? But, but what is that telling us? And why is it that they're expressing more optimism? So then we like to go in more reductionistic and we say, well, it's because of this molecule that's produced and because of this molecule that's produced, it seems to be that the people that are healthier or happier, they seem to have more of this molecule. So if we just give them more of this molecule, yes. all of a sudden we'll have a lot more happier people. Yes, that's an approach that I think I can wrap my head around having heard before. Yes. Right, getting so into the very specific thing that happens. Right. And maybe it's my hippie love, but just like there's more... There's more going on than that. It's all, everything is, is connected. Yes. Like our body and soul. See, I don't know what you know, but I, I've i learned a lot about just how it's all sort of connected mm -hmm. and how there's more than just the one thing going on. Yeah, absolutely. And so systems, systems biology uh, attempts to incorporate in a variety of different ways these variables, right? That's... That's the way forward. And I say it's the, it's the medicine of the future. On some degree, I think it's also been the medicine of the past. And so uh, people have heard the term, you know, alpha and omega or beginning and the end. Uh, the reality is I think that this approach or this idea is around us in nature. It's been with us forever as far as what makes a healthy system. And there happen to be some incredibly intelligent people that created a system of medicine around the system of nature that they saw in displaying health. You know, people often say, don't, don't disrupt the pristine nature because it's, it is what is basically propagating health. It's propagating a healthy environment on its own. And the fascinating thing is that if we left, if we left this earth, right, or if we were gone in our absence, those, those things or those systems that were present are actually the things that could provide greatest amount of health to us currently. And why? Because those are, the th those are the things that would sustain life in our absence. And what we're pur pursuing and have been pursuing for many, many years, honestly, is a, a monetary, industrial-focused um, agenda to supplant what we already have and know that exists around us um, for the intention of um, isolating and creating greater wealth for a very few. And, and that's reductionistic medicine, uh, I would say, gone awry. And that's what we see happening, is that people are taking advantage or breaking these, they're breaking and isolating these things down. They're saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to, we see that this thing that exists in nature happens to exist in a variety of different plants, right? We can see that this performs a certain function. 
but we can create something that looks really, really similar to it. And if we create that, it's our creation, not Earth's creation. Therefore, we can patent it. And if we patent it, then we can determine what the price is. And, well, whatever the market will bear, then we can just raise or lower the price. And um, all we have to do is uh, inform the doctors and inform people that, hey, we have this wonderful miracle drug and it helps to reduce blood pressure or it helps to um, decrease uh, dyslipidemia or with which is increased levels of, of fat in the blood, or it helps to decrease blood sugar, right? And then we just market it and sell it, and people need it, and good, we're golden, and no one else can touch it. Why? Because it's ours, we created it, we built it. But what happens if man is gone? What happens if man is gone? Then that compound that was patented, because it didn't exist in nature and wasn't created in nature, and wouldn't be created in nature naturally that we can tell, as far as we can tell, um, was was essentially patented by man. That that's that will not exist in nature. It doesn't exist in nature. And when man goes, it's gone. I haven't understood what you've said for the last <laughs> five minutes. So you keep talking if you want. I so, <laughs> but no, I, it's fine. But I, it's, I it's a fun thing, and I've and I've gone off on a variety of different things, like I usually do. Like I usually do. But, um, but this is at the core of. I mean, it's not like you're out there, uh, you know, storming the Capitol. This is not an act of of insurrection. But at some point, your existence is a bit of a revolutionary one. Like your day to day is in this field so counter to most health approaches in this country that like I feel where your passion comes from. Right. Because you're up against a very strong tailwind, gale wind, like whatever forces are around, they're very strong. Mm -hmm. And you're you're up on that hill or on the boat. I don't know what metaphor I'm talking about, but you're in the middle of a lot of forces and you're standing strong. So your passion is totally, I feel it, I understand it. Well, I just don't, like, always understand what you're saying. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah, and I, I get it. I, I completely understand uh, that it's, uh, I'm expecting you ultimately to understand my life experience, so to speak, in a few words, right? Um, in, in 30 minutes, see if you can understand why I feel the way about medicine. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and I want you to, to feel that in 30 minutes when for me, it's it, again, a context space and time. Here's the whole system of the discussion. The context is we cannot, you cannot, it's hard for you to fully grasp in a single moment in 30 minutes, what I'm talking about. And now we're trying to apply that by taking a snapshot in time and thinking that we somehow understand you? Like, when you draw the blood, how long does it take them to draw your blood? I guarantee it's not 30 minutes. Maybe three. Right? Okay. There's a snapshot in time. Right. And think about all the things we've talked about in 30 minutes. Sure. And all the new functions that are happening after you pull that blood. Right? So are you saying okay? But are you saying that the blood tests? I'm are, saying are it's just snap. giving you a snapshot in time. Yeah. Right. And so the way you interpret it, because you're going to see different values at a variety of different times, they are naturally going to be they're going to ebb and flow. Just sure. that's just what's going to that's part of the system. Yeah. So we need to know: is this an ebb and a flow, or is this a projection towards something that's potentially a disease state? And that's where the narrative or the story comes alive. That's where the system, that's where you start to discover the system, right? Okay, we have, we have a lot of flooding, right? What's going on here? What's happening with the system? Or there's a lot of fires this year, right? What's happening with the system? Or is it because, is it because the system it is going through a typical or regular cycle and it's actually refreshing itself? Or is it in a, is it in a state of disease right, where maybe something was causing the excess dryness, right, and elicited that heat. So it really comes down to being able to address the context in space and time 
and, and looking at the body more from a macro view, understanding that you have a patient that you're seeing. I see you, I see my patients for short periods of time, and I tell them you are your doctor, right? I am your coach, ultimately. I am, I am giving you information. My job is to educate you. I want your, your brain to like go when it comes to understanding your body and your health. That's why I sit down and we do those lengthy reviews because I want you. We just drew your blood, and it's a, it's a significant amount of blood. I want you to understand your physiology, where it is, and where it possibly could be going. And so, once you have that narrative or that story, you understand yourself better from a physiological standpoint. Then you have then you can check in more to okay, this is more serious or more important for me to be able to address things. Right? I have to check in and engage in my own health. If I can get you checked in and to engage in your own health, then, then all I have to do from then on is, did you try this? Or how about this? Or give you a little more information. right? And, and then it literally becomes more of a doctor as teacher. In fact, if you look at the Latin roots of doctor, that's what it means. It doesn't mean he who lords over and controls, uh, you know, the, the medicine cabinet and the, the drug chest. It literally means educator, teacher, docere, okay? the doctor, the teacher, the physician. And so that's what I uh, believe I am. I'm a coach. I'm a teacher. I'm a physician. I help people. You're also a father who, when the alarm yep. goes off, needs to Gotta go get going, pick huh? up his kids or whatever. So that's um, where we are. That's where we are. It's so fascinating. I think that um, maybe as a final thing, if we could keep it short, that humans have always been drawn to narratives and stories, mm-hmm. as we all know. Is there a story where a patient comes in, has been dealing with a reductionist view of a uh, condition or their kid's condition, you were able to apply a systems approach and you saw results. Yes. I know there is one. Do yeah. you have one you want to bring up? Well, it, just recently I had a, um, I had a female patient and she was struggling um, with, she was struggling with a variety of different conditions, achy joints, painful, sore muscles. Um, this patient had recently actually also had uh, a thyroidectomy and, uh, I looked at her. I looked at her blood and evaluated different things, and I could see from there it wasn't it wasn't alarming. It wasn't in a way that was, you know, reductionistically okay based on the averages of you know the human race or based on the averages of this nation. You don't fall so far out of the norm that we're going to treat you. Uh, it wasn't there, but the narrative was there that she was pushing towards this state of inflammation and actually. Um, a bacterial-laden um, infection. And so we used a variety of different herbals that have those antibacterial properties, antiviral, antifungal properties, uh, and uh, within three to four days, she said completely energy went up, joints stopped aching, felt so much better. It's like She still feels a little bit tired near the end of the day, but her husband was like thanking me, oh, thank you so much for you know, for helping her as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a matter of, and this is not, this is not like you walk up on stage and the priest touches you and you're saved and now you can walk again or not, no. not saved. That's, that's actually a different thing, but like you can't walk and then someone touches you and, oh, says yeah, like, and he's like, and you're you healed. Right. This is yeah. not that. Cause you've helped me with some of my blood work and I've noticed huge changes with some of the herbals. So it is not, and to be out there stuff. This is this stuff works. Yes, and to be clear, my again, my approach is to integrate as much as possible the reductionistic view and systems biology, right? That's what I think is it's more of an integration of these two ideas of saying we've benefited in so many significant ways and w- who's to say we can't continue to benefit? We absolutely can to study each little minute microcosm of every, every little aspect of things. We can do that, and we can clear out all the variables as possible and just focus on one aspect. That helps us understand stuff. Right. But we also have to recognize that when we're dealing with a patient in clinical practice, we're dealing with a system. 
Well, what would a doctor hypothetically, and maybe I just overuse this term, Western medicine or doctor, what could hypothetically have happened if that blood work was read by someone else in a more traditional hospital or doctor setting? Well, her, pa- her, her blood work had been evaluated by other people, and she was just fine. There's nothing oh. wrong with you. So they gave her that, that spiel? Yeah. You're fine? You're fine. There's nothing. Your blood work is good. Your blood work's great. Wow. Okay, well, my I have achy joints. I'm sore all over. My, I I get super tired in the afternoon. I can't make it through work. I wanna. I almost want to slit my husband's throat. Like I'm just. I'm done with it, right? And so it's. That's where you are, and that's where some people are. That's where we get to, and you go in, and you you're told this, but I I honestly tell my patients, you should be grateful, that the Western medical doctor, who prescribes synthetic chemical medications that are potentially and quite likely toxic and drugs and surgery, right? That's what he prescribes or she said to you, there's nothing wrong with you. Therefore, I'm not going to prescribe what I have in my tool chest. I think that's a green light for, Hey, go find a natural health physician, find a uh, a practitioner that can help you, someone who studies systems biology, find someone and they will help you. They will help you get better improved energy, uh, in better sleep. You'll have all of these type of uh, symptoms that you've been saying. They just, you seem like you're off or you feel off. It doesn't seem right. Or you've continued to just blame on getting older because you're what, 38 now. 38 is not old, but I hear patients all the time, man, this is probably just because I'm getting old. No, it's probably just because we need to look deeper at things and start evaluating and get more serious about your health. Uh, and, th- and that's just the fact of where we are. All right. If they want to get more serious about their health and uh, contact your office, how do they do that? Well, you can find us at CHW Heber. See, I can even hear. I can even hear you like bashful. Like you're not a seller. You're like you're such a pure soul in terms of wanting to help people. Like when I give you the platform to sell, you can find me at <laughs> CHW Heber, baby. Uh, I will help t- you. Limited time. Uh, limited time only. The first ten callers to uh, <laughs> oh, we'll I get like a free that. special stress ball and uh, a stress ball reliever. There you go. Okay, CHW Heber. You can find us at CHW Heber. You can also dot, dot com. Dot com. You can there also we go. The call. Whole website. You can call our phone. You can text our phone as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I have an Instagram page, Doctor Ron, Ron Dumar. Dumar. You can find me on Facebook at Community Health and Wellness. Uh, I have a lot of research that I post on Community Health and Wellness Facebook page. And if, if you're folks, interested in that stuff, yeah. And there's also the T with Doctor D. All mm-hmm. different words. D just the letter. Um, on all your podcast platforms. Yep. Thank you, Nick, for helping me sell myself. <laughs> well, it was embedded deep into the podcast. We got to work on that. You yeah. know, it's all about selling yourself. Unfortunately, the message is there. Yeah. And we just want people to hear it, right? For sure, we do want people to hear it. I think it's an important message, and I think we'll be able to help a lot of people as we share it. Namaste. Namaste. Do-do-do.